Okay. Good morning, my name is Mika Mayakawa and I will be presenting the final briefing for the Safety and Fraud Enforcement for Seafood Act, um, conveniently dubbed the Safe Seafood Act. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Ariel Shapiro and Jillian Thiebert, as well as the support and research from the rest of our group, and of course, the guidance of our faculty advisor, Professor Palmer. So, to dive right in, uh, the Safe Seafood Act is, in effect, a consumer protection bill. It seeks to restore consumer confidence in the, safe, safe, uh, in the seafood market after startling recent studies by groups like Oceana and the Boston Globe that reported about a third of all seafood sold in restaurants and markets as mislabeled. Now, malicious intent or not, that's a pretty startling number, and it grows even larger with seafood that's most commonly found in restaurants like Red Snapper, Chilean Sea Bass, or Grouper, mislabeled up to 77% of the time. So the goal of the Safe Seafood Act is to ensure consumer safety and achieve accuracy in the seafood market through improved and increased inspections, standardized seafood names, and greater interagency cooperation between the uh, National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA. To illustrate the pros and cons of the Safe Seafood Act, I'd like to focus on the journey of the wild Gulf of Mexico caught gag grouper. The wild caught gag grouper is a firm white flesh fish popular in restaurants and markets. Um, however, it's found to be mislabeled at least 25% of the time with weak fish or cheaper farm fish like Pangaceus, which you can see in the bottom there, um, appearing as grouper. This is a problem because these cheaper farmed fish uh, sell for a fixed price, whereas grouper uh, operates on a fluctuating market price. Worse, uh, we get overfished and vulnerable species like speckled hind sold as grouper, and perhaps most prescient to human health concerns, we have fish on the FDA's do not eat list for sensitive groups like pregnant women and children due to high mercury content, uh, like king mackerel being sold as grouper. Though not directly addressed in the bill, there are a lot of environmental consequences to continued seafood fraud. In the case of the grouper, because of its long life cycle of up to 30 years, it makes several appearances in already very complex food web. An important biological fact to note about the gag grouper is that gags are protogenous hermaphrodites, so they all begin as females and then develop into males later in life, um, usually around 11 years of age, but this depends on size. Um, Male gags have dropped from as high as 17% of the population in the 70s to as low as 2% reported in the 90s, leaving fewer breeders. Overfishing has snared many females that might potentially turn into males and has thrown the natural process out of balance. As you can see from this graph, the gag grouper population has slashed to under 40% of a minimum healthy level. The fish have been caught at more than two and a half times the sustainable rate, and in the past, only a small portion of habitat has been um, preserved or protected, with a lack of scientifically sound fishing limits contributing to the species' decline. Within the species, grouper fish are often confused. There's a black grouper, a yellow mouth grouper, scamp grouper, and gag grouper, and that's just to name a few of the 56 types of fish that are included under groupers. It is certainly a cause for mislabeling, and once the head and fins are removed from the fish, which is often done to maintain freshness, the discerning characteristics of the fish are gone. We can see with this case study how contentious it will be to try and create a uniform guide to acceptable market names, as per the stipulation of the Safe Seafood Act. However, should nomenclature be resolved, we can see how this could really benefit the consumer. Having information like those shown on the seafood facts table here um, will make transparent and otherwise very obfuscated chain of custody. But we don't have to hypothesize about the success of this kind of system. We can actually see how it works. Um, affixed to the gills of the red snapper and the grouper here are uh, gulf wild tags that trace each fish back to its original source. Uh, much like Rainforest Alliance or Fair Trade Certification Programs, this voluntary program aims to ensure ongoing conservation of and improvement of fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico. And it also improves the accountability and data collection under an innovative management plan. Gulf Wild was conceived of, actually, by environmentally conscious fishermen um, teaming up with NOAA and other nonprofits. And this was all in response to a lot of the seafood fraud that the state of Florida, home of the gag grouper, is fraught with. These tags work twofold. They help in accurate data collection and future-focused management plans, and they also provide transparency for their consumers. Um, this is a screenshot from the gulfwild.com website. So if you were to go to the market and you were gonna get a 
Gulf Wild Red Snapper, you could go home and get a unique code on those tags and type it into the space here and it'll trace it back to the port that it came in on, the vessel that it came off of, the method of catch, as well as possibly some information about the fishermen. But bringing it back to federal regulations, um, the existing techniques include checking for color, taste, weight, and smell. This is largely done actually to check for freshness and contamination and is not a reliable way of detecting fraud. None of these sensory inspection techniques, for example, could ex uh, distinguish two white fish fillets from each other or say a gag grouper from a black grouper. And the FDA, if they were to discover fish fraud, has the authority to slap companies with strongly worded letters sometimes some small penalties, and in very few cases, seize, uh, prevent businesses from importing fish at all. But at present, the FDA experts say that it's primarily the responsibility of state and local agencies, not the FDA, to regulate food, uh, food stores and restaurants. Better technologies beyond that of the five senses are available, though. DNA identification, for example, is proven. Um, and it utilizes the CO1 sequence, which is also known as the barcode gene. It's a relatively short strand that provides the greatest interspecies uh, discriminatory power in a single gene. Its utility has been recognized by the FDA, which uses this gene exclusively for animal species identification. The barcode gene is amplified via PCR using a specific set of primers, and the DNA sequences uh, are performed, and you can see uh, you'll get an output of seafood ID data, and then you'll also have a published database, which is actually existing right now, internationally available. DNA testing like the one shown here require a lab, as well as more time and money than is available at the point of inspection. So there's a solution to this. Um, in 2008, we seemed to develop a, a lot of innovative technologies, including the food expert ID, and it's a portable DNA identification chip. Despite the availability of this accurate rapid data though, as you can see, it's very expensive and there's yet to be a market for such a device. In fact, the one pictured here was discontinued in 2009 just simply due to lack of demand. And while there are still similar products on the market, they come with a similar price tag. Um, and this price tag is usually the rationale often used by the opponents in restaurant and seafood processing industries. That the added regulatory costs for increased inspections, inspection programs, and technologies would outweigh the economic loss resulted by mislabeling. Yet continued mislabeling, or the do-nothing approach, means that fishermen who are trying to manage fisheries sustainably, like the ones in Gulf Wild, who manage the catch in the Gulf of Mexico, have to compete against double dealers who may have different priorities. So it, political support for increased regulation remains tepid, as it often does. Uh, the seafood industry is one of the least transparent in the food system. It has a long way to go before it can become more accountable to its consumers. The Safe Seafood Act, however, proposes a fairly simple set of regulations that has a capacity to mitigate a lot of environmental problems as well as economic and health ones. In other words, Better data leads to better fishery management with the aims of maintaining plenty of fish in the sea. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, a lot of AC. Hi, with the grouper, did you touch on the fact that with the rise uh, in water temperatures, we'll have an increased exposure to algae and toxins, and a fish like the grouper is going to be highly susceptible to that? And what you discussed is the safeguards here, they don't, they don't explore that. Did you, are you aware um, of that? You just didn't talk about it in this 10-minute presentation? Um, the Safe Seafood Act actually doesn't touch on that. It's not necessarily an environmental bill. However, Organizations like Gulf Wild, which is affiliated with like a lot of other sustainable management programs, does look into that. Um, I know that in 2005 there was a really big decline in the population due to red algal blooms in that region. Um, so there is a lot of sustainability effort to that end as well. Any other questions? Uh, I was just wondering at which point does, or do you know, do they have data on which point the mislabeling usually occurs at? Is it at the fisherman point, like point of sale at the port, or is it at the market, or is it at, you know, the final point of sale to the consumer? 
I think that it varies, especially when you're comparing domestic to international markets. Um, and I think that's something that like better data, which this act proposes, could help to sort of make transparent. Have there been, um, well, are there any financial incentives for the voluntary program? Um, they're not, uh, it's actually not made clear on the site, but I, I would want to say that if, I mean, if you're comparing it to something like Rainforest Alliance or Fair Trade or Organic Certified Things, that you're going to pay a premium for it, but the program's been successful in the past two years. Um, there's no hard data to accompany that statement, but it's been successful in all of the media. So I would like to think that with the growth that it's experienced, there's definitely an incentive for fishermen to be involved because they want to be a part of like a sustained market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.